couple of months ago, I was reading a book and learned an interesting fact that, that in the ocean, there is something called the crush line. And the crush line for submarines is about 1,300 feet. Um, it could be more. The actual number is classified, I guess. But the crush line is the depth at which a submarine implodes. The, the force of the pressure on the outside of the submarine from the water at that depth becomes so great that the structure of the submarine can no longer withstand that force and it caves, it implodes. A lot of marriages today have reached the crush line. A lot of marriages today are in danger of descending to the crush line. And today's teaching in Mark chapter 10, we are coming back to Jesus as he explains on uh, the, the word of God on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Every one of us who are married know that marriage is difficult. And so these are, I think, a timely teaching for all of us. As a matter of fact, I would say these teachings are timely for everybody. Um, I, I touched on this a little bit last week, but I would say that if, if you're single, this is important for you because you may be thinking about getting married someday, and you need to have biblical perspectives instilled in you before you go into marriage so that you can be equipped uh, to have the best marriage you can and to have a, a marriage that honors Christ. Um, you may be in a marriage right now that is going great and is strong. This will help reinforce your marriage, your perspectives on marriage, and it'll help equip you in the, uh, in the chance that someday you might find yourself in a dark season in your marriage. And so having these tools from this passage, I think are going to be helpful. You may be married and you may be rationalizing a divorce right now. You may be on a trajectory for divorce right now. You may be one of those submarines that is descending to the crush line very quickly and your marriage is about to implode. And I think this is a very important instruction for you today as well, because if you don't have biblical grounds for a divorce, then you need to pull up. And I think that you need to have a proper fear of God. You need to, hopefully, I can divert you away from uh, that, that crush line in your marriage. And uh, if, in fact, however, you do have biblical grounds for a divorce, then I would, hopefully, at the end of this message, you would be treading very carefully, very prayerfully, very fearfully um, towards divorce because the Bible says God hates divorce. And I think a lot of us would want marriage to be like um, an umbrella tent where um, we are underneath, we are in this sphere called marriage and there's, we can turn in any direction and just exit. When in fact, marriage is more like a house with one small narrow door to get out of it. <clears throat> so be very careful if you're married, you're rationalizing divorce and you're trying to get out of it. Um, you may be divorced and remarried, and if uh, that's you, um, please don't don't tune out from this message. Um, I think this applies to you as well, and I have actually some specific encouragement and, and guidelines for you at the end of the message. Um, so Jesus, uh, let's, let's kind of review where we're at here. Jesus is approached by the Pharisees, and they ask him a question about marriage and divorce. And they say, can a man divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus points them to Moses and he says, well, what did Moses say? And by asking the question, as we learned last week, he was essentially saying, what did God say through Moses? What does the word of God say? So much is loaded into that, that concept of pointing people back to the word of God, the authority of the word of God. The Pharisees respond to Jesus by saying, well, Moses said, a man could divorce his wife and send her away. And Jesus then um, picks up where we're going to pick up today. And he goes back beyond Moses to God in the beginning at creation when man and woman were created, when marriage was created. And Jesus is now going to explain what marriage is by referring back to the, the account of marriage in the first few chapters of the Bible in Genesis. And he's going to, we're going to learn what the nature of marriage is, what the purpose of marriage is, um, what a man and a woman are, and why 
um, a man and a woman are joined together in marriage and why it's a lifelong thing. And, and so I just want to start out by saying this is such an important point that Jesus is making here that we have to see as it touches on the issue of discipleship. You have to see your own discipleship as a follower of Jesus Christ in the context of how you do marriage. You know, marriage is not over here, and then my discipleship and following Jesus is over here. Your marriage is fundamentally, okay, an expression of your discipleship. And discipleship, again, is a person following the commands and the teachings of Jesus. A person being concerned about the will of God. I like to say it this way. A, a disciple is someone who goes to the Word of God to understand the will of God so that they can be conformed to the ways of God. And marriage is not distinct from that. Marriage is, is right at the center of that because your discipleship is going to be carried out in your role as a husband or as a wife. And so if you really are, if we really are concerned about obeying the Lord Jesus Christ and, and learning his commands and, and carrying them out in our life, then, then our marriages will be one of the primary uh, contexts that we, uh, that we function as disciples. So, very importantly, we need to see marriage as a discipleship issue. And the reason I think Jesus points the Pharisees back to creation also is because that's where you see the, the, the clear uh, will of God expressed for what marriage is, what his intentions of marriage are. And if our views of marriage have been here, okay, which is what the Pharisees were doing, then Jesus is going, no, you need to go back to creation and have your view of marriage lifted back up to where it should be, okay? So let's get into it. We're going to look next at the creation. We saw the command last week. Now we're going to go and we're going to explore creation. So now we move into the creation, and verses 6 through 9 show this for us. Jesus replied, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. So there's the account of the creation. Now notice the structure of what Jesus says here. Verses 6, 7, and 8 are explanatory. Verse 9 is a command. And the command for those who are married in verse 9, not to separate, is based on the explanation of what marriage is in the previous verses 6 through 8. The Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask him about breaking up a marriage. Jesus points them back to the beginning when marriage was created. They point to Moses, Jesus points them further back than Moses to God. They wanted to point to the exception in marriage, Jesus pointed them to the rule. This is so important because Jesus, in pointing their minds and their attention, and ours as well today, back to creation, means that Jesus is pointing people back to the will of God. Because there's no clearer picture of what God's will is for marriage than when he created marriage in the beginning. So we're going to look at verses 6 through 9 in five points. We're going to break it up into five points. The first point is this about marriage, that it is created. Okay. Notice what Jesus says. He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Okay. God is the maker of man and woman, and he is the maker of marriage, the way in which man and woman go together. It's his intention. It's his design. Um, listen, man did not arise from lower life forms. He, he's not the product of 
um, random natural processes and has evolved into what he is today. And the relationship between men and women has not come as the product of some sort of long evolutionary cycle. Man didn't come up from lower life forms. Man was created by the highest life form. Okay, man is here on purpose with design and intention. He's not here accidentally, just kind of appearing on the scene without any purpose or any real meaning. No, there is meaning and there is purpose to the existence of men and women as God created them. And there is meaning and purpose to the way in which men and women go together in a marriage relationship. Okay, so here's the important thing. Uh, another important thing about the fact that marriage is the creation of God. And that is this, that, that God being the creator of marriage is the authority of marriage. In other words, it's his prerogative to lay out the rules for what a marriage relationship is. A good illustration can be found in our home. We have toys for the five kids in our home, and there are what you might call community toys where they don't belong to any one child, they belong to all the kids. And then in that way, the general rules uh, apply where whoever is playing with something first um, gets to uh, keep playing with it. You can't come up and steal it. If they set it down because they have to run upstairs and go potty, you can't steal it just because they had to go potty. Um, if they uh, have it set down in some sort of arrangement with other toys and they go to pick up another toy. You can't snatch it when they're not looking because they didn't have it in their hands. You know, so those are community toys. But then there are toys that belong exclusively to one child or another. Um, take Legos, for instance. Say Evan gets some Legos for his birthday and he gets a T-Rex Lego set and he builds that Lego set up into a T-Rex. Okay, uh, you can't have Reese or Levi or someone coming along and just taking that without asking. They have to get Evan's permission to be able to play with that Lego set. And if Evan does give them permission, Evan might lay down some rules for how they can play with it and they can't deviate from those rules. So for instance, Evan might say, you can't break apart this T-Rex and build something else that you want. You have to play with this T-Rex. And Evan might say something like, you can't let the T-Rex play with uh, the Star Wars Lego set over there, um, or you can't let the T-Rex take the T-Rex outside. The point being, Evan is the one who owns the Lego set. Evan is the one who has the rights, uh, the right to choose if someone can be playing with the Lego set, and he's the one who has the right to lay down any rules for people who he might let play with that Lego set. It's the same thing in marriage. In marriage, God's the one who created marriage. We get to play in this institution that God calls marriage, but he's the one who lays down the rules for how we get to play with them. These things that Jesus says and the things that God says in his word, the teachings we find in there, they're not suggestions. Uh, they're not guidelines. They are commands to be obeyed for people who are married, um, husbands to their wives, wives to their husbands. These, these are not optional. These are not things that to be taken lightly or to be blown off or be selective about. God is the authority. And if he is the authority, and if we live our discipleship out in marriage, then it means that God's holiness, that God's authority takes precedence in our marriage and that, had, that his word has more weight than our words and our thoughts and our intentions for marriage. Marriage is what he says it is, and we are obligated to him when we enter into this relationship. So, number one, God created marriage, okay? It's his design, and we are obligated to his authority in that. Secondly, we see that uh, marriage is complementary. Okay, so at the beginning of creation, Jesus quotes, God made them male and female. So God not only made and created man and woman for himself, okay, but he made them for each other also. Okay, so that, that's, that's built in from the very beginning is that a man and a woman go together. He designed them to go together in unity as a pair. And man was made with the woman in mind, and woman was made with the man in mind. I love the wording of Genesis 2.18 when it says, uh, that when, it, when it tells us God's words, he says, I will make a helper suitable for the man. 
I will make a helper suitable for the man. Verse 23 in Genesis chapter 2 says this, God brought her to the man. Now, all of this is strongly conveying and showing us a picture of when God made man, he had the woman in mind. And when he made the woman, he had man in mind. And when he finally made them both, he brought them together to be together. And they were to be a perfect complement to one another. The male complements the female. The female complements the male. Now, I'll just add this too. You, you see in Genesis chapter 2, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. And then you see the very next thing that happens is, is God began to bring all the animals to the man. The woman wasn't created yet. And he's supposed to name all of the animals. And while he's naming all the animals, it says that no suitable helper for the man was found among the animals. In other words, in other words, you have God, and then you have man, and then you have animals. And in a way, animals are not man's best friend. Um, and God certainly uh, was more than sufficient for man, but man needed a companion who was an equal with him, who was human with him, and to be a complement to him. And what you find then is, is once man is sees that there's nothing for him to be an equal companion with him, then God makes the woman. If you keep in mind how God made the woman in the first place, it'll enhance this idea of a man and a woman complementing each other in marriage even further. He didn't gather up dust like he did with the man and then breathe life into it. What he did is he, he did something that just created a, a far deeper and more intimate connection. He literally took... Um, flesh from Adam's own body. And then he went and he formed that flesh into the woman. And when he did that, he then took the woman and escorted her back to Adam to be his wife. And so she's there standing next to him, made of the same stuff that he's made of. And then we see that Adam gets far more than just his rib back. In a more wonderful way, she comes and returns to his side, and he becomes one flesh with her. This one flesh term is very important, and it means much more than just simply a physical union, if it even means that at all. It most certainly is pointing to a new identity. I mean, in a way, you and your spouse Although distinct individuals for sure, you guys now have an identity that is a combined identity with each other. Okay, You can't think of you without your spouse or your spouse without you. You can't think of Justin without thinking of Annie. And you can't think of Annie without thinking of Justin. Because there is an exclusiveness to us now. There is a, there is a special way in which we go together as a pair now that no one else can share it. OK, um, that's not to say that I don't have my own interests, my own thoughts, my own my own um, opinions, my own individuality. But I am now a half to a whole. Now, most certainly she's the better half, but we are now not complete without each other because we have been we have been brought together in this marriage unity where we now have a new identity that includes the other that includes each other. That my identity now includes my wife, and we form a whole. We form one together now in the sight of God. And so one flesh, it's a very powerful term, and it all ties into the original creation, and it all ties into this idea that a man and a woman go together in such a beautifully spiritual, physical, emotional, complementary way. The third thing that we see is that God is the one who combines a man and a woman together in a marriage. We saw that God's the creator. We saw that God created them to be complementary. And now we see specifically that God is the one um, who combines the man and the woman. Notice what Jesus says in verse 9. He says, quote, Therefore, what God has joined together, what God has joined together, not what man has joined together, but what God has joined together. So when a man and a woman... Uh, make a covenant with each other and they enter into this institution that God has created called marriage. Um, when that happens, God does a, a, 
an act of uniting the man and the woman together as husband and wife, and he forms a unity between them that prior to that did not exist. Okay, so it's God is the one who is active in joining and cementing a man and a woman together uh, in, in, a, in a marriage relationship. And the reason that God does this is so that under his blessing and his joining together, a husband and a wife are to enjoy each other, to bless each other, uh, to help each other, uh, and really to carry out the will of God together and, and to propagate the human race uh, and to enjoy the way in which you do propagate the human race. All of that is involved in this unity that God creates. And so God not only creates marriage, not only does he create man and woman to complement each other in marriage, but also the actual unity that occurs in a marriage between a man and a woman is achieved by God. The fourth thing that we see Jesus teaching about marriage is the consecration of marriage, um, the consecration of the husband and the wife to each other. The word consecration means to be set apart unto. Uh, in the Bible, it's used about a lot of things. It can be used about people or things that are set apart from common uh, use and dedicate, set apart exclusively to God, um, dedicated to his purposes, dedicated to him alone. And in a marriage context, uh, this, really, uh, this really brings out um, the way in which a man is set apart from every other woman and dedicated to his wife alone in the way that a woman is set apart from every other man and dedicated to her husband alone. You'll notice in the, what Jesus is saying in chapter 10, it just, it's smack with all of this uh, exclusiveness between the husband and the wife. So uh, verse seven, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, you see, they go together, kind of picking up on our theme just a few moments ago, they go together and they belong together and they are, their existence as a husband and as a wife are now in dedication to each other in marriage. Um, this is really brought out in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want to read to you verses 3 through 5 there because pay attention, Paul is going to talk about the way in which a husband is the possession of his wife and the wife is the possession of of her husband. And this is really a picture of consecration in marriage. So verse three, Paul says, uh, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. That's talking about the physical relationship. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Listen to what Paul is saying there. He is giving us, he is giving instructions to husbands and wives not to deny each other their bodies, in marriage because my wife's body belongs to me, my body belongs to my wife, and that is a fact of marriage. That is what it means to be consecrated unto each other. Everything about me, mind, heart, body, and so forth belongs to my wife. Everything about my wife belongs to me. A really good example might be if you thought about two properties adjacent to each other and that pr those two properties would have a dividing line going down the middle that would distinguish them as two individual unique properties. And that line would mark the end of one property and the beginning of the other. Marriage would be like erasing that line and the ownership now not being, we would not be two owners owning individual properties, but we would become combined owners of both properties and the properties would retain their individual unique look and features but now both properties become my 
possession and both properties also become her possession. And so marriage, in a way, is like removing that borderline that distinguishes his and hers, and it be, and, and the, whole, the whole land becomes ours together. That's what it means to be one flesh. That's what it means to be united together. Not only are we somehow fused together by God, but having been fused together, my wife becomes, you might say, my physical property, an extension of my own body. She's my rib, my rib, and I am hers now. My body is an extension of hers and belongs to her. I have rights to her. She has rights to me that nobody else has a right to. This idea of being consecrated to each other also affects another relationship that all of us have in our lives, and that is our relationship with our parents. That relationship changes when we get married. Parents are always to be honored, but the dynamics of the relationship change once a man marries his wife and a wife marries her husband. You'll notice what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10. He says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. So part of what it means to be united to your wife involves a necessary severance in your relationship with your parents. And what that means is that a person, a husband and a wife, they no longer live to please their parents first. Now they live to please each other first. There's no longer a dependence on the parents there is a transfer of dependence to one's spouse. The fifth thing that we see Jesus teaching about marriage in this passage is the commitment of marriage. Marriage is a lifelong commitment. It's permanent. It's not temporary in nature. And I'll just suggest three things that strongly uh, support this. Number one, nowhere in the Genesis account or Jesus' reiteration in the Gospels of the Genesis account do we see that marriage is something that's temporary. The whole thought behind everything that uh, Genesis says and that Jesus says in the Gospels is that marriage is, for, is a union that is to last for someone's entire life. Um, secondly, we see that the Bible clearly teaches that marriage dissolves legitimately, you might say, at death. In Romans chapter 7, verse 2, it says, uh, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Okay, so again, Paul is reiterating uh, Genesis and the teachings of Jesus that marriage is not something that is supposed to end prior to um, the death of a spouse. And the third thing we see is that Jesus said, in the next life, nobody is going to be married. Uh, now, there may be some hallelujahs and some amens <laughs> right now coming from some husbands and some wives. Uh, but the teaching in Mark chapter 12 that Jesus says is this. He says, quote, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. And what he's what he's pointing out here is that marriage is for something in this world, not in the next world. It's something for this life, not in the next life. Meaning that once this life is over, then marriage and our, our experience with marriage also is over. All this teaching is leading to the command uh, in, uh, in, in verse 9 of Mark chapter 10, where Jesus says, let man not separate. The, the command is that man is not to undo what God has done. Man is not to rip apart, okay, what God has joined together. God brought the woman to the man to be joined together in unity, and man is not to send her away and destroy that unity. We know that God hates that because in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, as we mentioned earlier, says God hates divorce. And so, before any of us would pursue a track of divorce, we need to, as I said earlier, carefully, thoughtfully, prayerfully, fearfully go down that road. Now, what happens if a divorce and the potential or the reality of a remarriage happens? Let's look at that next.